Oh, I forgot to mention my drink looked and tasted like swamp water. <laughs> when the salmon came, came out, it flat out stunk. One of those dishes where you take one bite and look at the person you're eating with to see if they share the same level of concern. <laughs> Welcome back to The Walkthrough, where we walk you through this week's trending topics in real estate. I am your co-host, moderator, and captain of BAM, Dan O'Neill, coming to you live from Long Island, New York. And before I introduce my co-host and today's panel, I want to say a sincere thank you to everyone who has been watching, liking, commenting, making this one of, if not, BAM's most popular shows. Last week's episode was our most watched, most liked, most commented, so sincerely thank you all. Today with me, after what feels like weeks, months, years, I am joined by my married co-host, Mr. Eric, the Baroque Agent Simon. Eric, great Amazing. wedding, great job. You absolutely you. crushed. It looks like you have uh, your hair has grown. How was your wedding <laughs> week? How was washing elephants for the last two weeks? And uh, how are you? Dan, you know what I could do now? I could do the welcome to my family Johnny oh, Drinks God. move <laughs> with oh, my get ring. Him get him out of here. Get this guy out. <laughs> it's great. I am married. I am happy. I am satisfied. I am stress-free. If anyone has been through a wedding here, Jason, you have. Tessa, Dan might be right around the corner. Who knows? Not you guys getting married to each other, <laughs> but to your significant others. It's very stressful. It was hanging over my head. This date is engraved in your brain every single day. That was the topic of every conversation. Every time my parents called, I was scared it was about the wedding. Every time Ann's parents called, every time Ann talked to me, it was about the wedding. And now I can focus fully on BAM and crushing it on the walkthrough. So I am happy to be married. Say congratulations in the comments. Let's get yeah. this uh, engagement going here. Also say hello to Diane, who is Eric's mother, who let me know that she watches the show. Big <laughs> fan. She is the, uh, the GOAT. Um, all right. Also today joined, uh, joining us, we have coach, speaker, marketing and social media rock star with arguably the best name in real estate. Check out her new podcast to the HOA house of agents with her handsome boyfriend, uh, coming to us from Scottsdale, Arizona. We have miss Tessa Bella. Tessa, how you doing? I am doing great. Thank you for the intro. It's always so interesting to hear how someone else introduces you. So that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Of course. And lastly, returning guest, a familiar, handsome face, team lead, content machine, founder of Refer and, I don't know, 500 other projects, but the man, the myth, the legend, Jason Cassidy from sunny San Diego. Jason, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Eric, you'll be a pro once you know. You can actually use it to open a beer bottle, too. You gotta oh, yeah. I usually just use my eye sockets for that, so I think, <laughs> I think I'm good. Eric, but you, you, I even had a beer. This guy just drinks old fashions and just slugs them, fires it right down his gullet. He doesn't even I had, I had 40 beers in Thailand and then 40 Mai Tais and 40 Mojitos. By the way, you can't introduce Cassidy as from Sandy, sunny San Diego when he's looking alabaster like that. We need Cassidy to get a little tan for the summer walkthroughs. Let me change the, the warmth on my light. Yeah, put a different light. filter on. My God. <laughs> this guy this guy was just in UV index of, of 11. He's going to chirp you now? Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Today, we're talking about what Eric learned on his honeymoon. <laughs> anything. What, what consumers can look for or what consumers look for in their agent, boomers taking over the market, and how we can market to them in a more efficient and effective way. But before we do, Eric, please, for the love of God, a word from our sponsors. The Walkthrough Podcast. Now, the Walkthrough Podcast is presented by Keeping Current Matters, your go-to source for the insights and content you need to be the market expert. KCM is the best in the biz at taking the latest housing data and curating it into powerful, epic visuals and marketing content for video and social media that helps you look great and gives you an enormous amount of value for your clients and your prospects. Mm -hmm. At a time when the market's changing and consumers are asking questions most agents don't know the answer to, KCM makes it easy to build your brand as the market expert. Check out trykcm.com forward slash BAM so you can master the market and your marketing today. There is also an epic link down below. Click it, sign up, free trial. It's epic. <sighs> This guy's back, huh? Let's go. All he needed was a honeymoon, a two week honeymoon. Look at that. His, his hair's grown back. He's tan. He's got a beard. My Invisalign's <laughs> out. I could speak clearly now. I don't have that lisp that kept popping up every now and then. I don't know what's going on. The lisp dis disappeared. Now I it's have gone. it. Oh my God. Yeah, you do. You got it now. <laughs> all right. Listen. Uh, all right. So uh, make sure to like, comment here. 
Uh, on to topic number one, three things I learned about content creation on my honeymoon, written by the man himself. Uh, Eric, what could you have possibly learned? Please, please tell us your content revelations while you were washing elephants and eating duck lard, please, for love of God. Yes, that duck larb actually almost put me in the Chiang Mai hospital, by the way. Do not visit the House of Ginger restaurant. That was one of the worst meals I've ever had in my life. I wrote a review, and the review actually it? got deleted can I read because it? of how vicious it was. I can Wait, like on, on Yelp, you did Wait, it? Can I, can I read the review? On Google Review. On Google Reviews. Can I, read, can I read it? You want to read it right now? I want to read it right now. It's one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my entire life. I'm yeah, an sure. I'm expert reviewer. This is something that I am very highly passionate about. Okay. This is the most insane review I've ever read in my life. Ready? You want me to read it, Dan? Sure. I, I have mean, it right it's... here. All right. Text it to me real quick. Okay. Okay. Haley send it Parker. to me. In, anyway, in, in the meantime, before I read this review, I will get into a couple things I learned on my honeymoon. And this actually is helpful for agents, by the way. We're not just going to talk about the UV index and me yeah. washing elephants. But it does certainly matter what time you post. So there was a 14-hour time difference in Thailand, 14 hours ahead. So when I was... I was in the future, basically. <laughs> you know, I was you know, Friday when it was Thursday. I was watching basketball games in reverse. They completely had my head in knots. But what I learned is if I uploaded something at 5 p.m. in Thailand, this was 3 a.m. in Los Angeles. And I thought that doesn't matter when people wake up. This will still get engagement, at least at 6 a.m. on the East Coast. These posts got zero engagement, nothing. And it shows you how important it is to get that initial engagement right off the bat. And then it made me think of East Coast people like you, Dan, um, and Byron, when you guys upload something at 6 or 7 a.m., you're missing on an enormous part of the country that is not up yet and not engaging with your content initially. So I was wondering, uh, Tess, I'll kick it to you, if you schedule your posts or if you post at a specific time or notice that you get more engagement at a certain time. Yeah, I definitely have always been a big believer in paying attention to the timeframes like that my audience is engaged for a, the big beginning part of my, especially the speaking part of my career, where I was speaking at events and doing and hosting events, a lot of that was done on the East Coast, despite me living on the West Coast. And so a big segment of my audience was based in like Florida and Washington, D.C. and the Carolinas and stuff like that. And so, you know, what I would have assumed if I didn't actually look at it is that I would post according to being on Pacific time, when in reality, the majority of my audience was uh, East Coast. And I think that we see that change quite a bit. So it's super important to check your analytics and actually follow that rather than just posting whenever you feel like it. Yeah. And it's the, the most active time analytics. Like I used to not be a fan of these. I thought it was irrelevant and didn't mean much. But if you post pretty much between the sixes or the nines on the East Coast, so you're getting that West Coast time as well, that's probably the most effective. Jason, what about you? Have you, do you schedule your posts? Do you post at a specific time or see more yeah. engagement? I try to keep it between noon and at noon and six p, uh, Pacific time because I'm still catching the East Coast too. So I won't post after seven o'clock our time because you're going to lose the East Coast. And and I think it matters. We, you, you said it too. I used to think it didn't matter because they'll see it eventually. But we know that like the virality of a post, a lot of that first hour matters. So your likes, comments, shares, saves in that first hour or first 30 minutes matters. So if you're posting at 2 a.m., yeah, you're just missing a lot. So while your your biggest fans might see it, you're just not getting those early indicators. And, and so it's so funny because like you'll hear everybody say it's like, oh, well, it doesn't matter as long as the one right person. It's like, yeah, but you're doing it to get the most reach possible. So like if you can post it at 8 a.m. or noon and noon's better, just wait till noon. Like you, you should be looking at your analytics. And for the most part, I think all of us, it's going to be about the same time, sometime midday ish. Tuesday through Thursday, weekends get a little squirrely. Stories do well on weekends, but the posts yep. don't do as well. Yep. Um, so Tuesday through Thursday, you know, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. your time ish should be okay. Yeah, and I think I, I just read something too about posting at the top of the hour. Everybody schedules their content for like five or six p. Right, like maybe kind of mix it up, throw it up at like 6.20 or 6.30. So it's not the top of the hour. That was just something I read in one of the, the trending reports that might help. But I think the, a few of the other things that you had written and then I'll kick it back to you to explain um, was you just taking a break, right? Like just having like a legitimate vacation yeah. break where like your phone's not blowing up. You don't have the stress. Like we, we go away all the time. Like, you know, Tessa, you said you're going away seven times this next month, but a lot of it is work related. You still have your phone on you. People really aren't respecting like, you're not on vacation, right? Like it's all work related. So you actually got a two week vacation of like, I wasn't even texting you. Like I, I was respecting, you know, you being on, on your honeymoon. So that definitely helped with your content creation and probably just your mindset 
And the other thing is like, when you go away like that, you kind of feel like, you know, your business is going to crash and burn or, oh my God, Eric's not posting for two weeks. Like, is this kid in jail? Is he dead? Is the content done? But two it, extreme possibilities. Right, two, at least the first one. Very real possibilities, but neither of them are true. And it just shows you like, it's kind of, you know, it's in your own head, right? Like nobody probably thought twice about it. Everyone. No one cared. Yeah. yeah. I taking this break was enormous because back in 2020, I kind of made a commitment, at least on the broke agent account, where I'm doing two or three feed posts a day, eight to 10 Instagram stories a day, no matter what, because I wanted to treat like a media company even before we had BAM, a media company, because I was like, this is how I'm going to grow the most. And every time someone logs on the app, I want them to see a new broke agent post. So I was kind of compulsive about that. And this is the first time, like the wedding day, the day after, and sporadically throughout the honeymoon where I didn't upload. And I know it sounds like, who cares? But- it, it was great to kind of get that out of my head and just see like, okay, it doesn't matter at all. Nobody cared. Nobody noticed. It's not like agents were sitting around waiting for me to do another Zestimate joke. Everybody's just going along with their lives. So it was great to have a break, extremely refreshing. And, you know, it does kind of spark your creative juices again when you're not just thinking about stuff. Cause when you're living like in that digital world and you're just consuming content and DMS and clicks and, retention and and what time should i post and that type of stuff you start to like lose your grasp on things so i don't know tessa have you ever taken like a big social detox break i know i used to think it's it's ironic that this is the topic i was reading through your article and that last point about um like sometimes taking a break is beneficial i have and i've always i mean for years been a big proponent of instagram it was the number one way i generated income it was the number one way i generated leads it was like this massive thing in my life and i was highly committed to high frequency of posting for years as well and i recently like part of it was i lost as much interest in doing it the way that i used to um of course you also see the normal fluctuation of like engagement and stuff and sometimes that gets annoying to just have to constantly chase like an algorithm that you're trying to play with um and so i took a little breather from instagram for a bit and yesterday was actually my first post back so ironic timing on that but um, i mean it wasn't extensive i just was kind of quiet on there for a couple weeks maybe a month or so um, were, but you, were you just like not posting or you just like weren't even like scrolling and, and opening up the app? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I've been really into TikTok and TikTok's so much more fun for me um, in the sense of like the instant gratification. You post a video and I got like 10,000 followers off one video. It was like that, that reward felt amazing. So I was definitely not spending nearly as much time as a creator or a consumer on Instagram. But yeah. it, I mean, I would still do things from time to time. It just wasn't quite there as much. And in coming back, I have such a refreshed approach to like how I'm going to be sharing content and excitement around doing so again. Uh, And then of course the added like engagement and stuff on that first post back didn't suck either. I definitely saw a pretty drastic change in how many people were engaging with that post versus my previous. I've noticed that less is becoming more almost on Instagram, the less I posted. So I went like a couple of days and then came back and that one blew up. And then the less I was posting on stories, we know if you let your story expire after 24 hours, the next story could do really well. So maybe just because of the oversaturation of Instagram, feeding it three to five times a day is kind of overdoing it where the algorithm is like, all right, this one wasn't good. So I'm not going to show them this one or this one. So maybe, you know, what Dan does, what Jason does, I mean, Jason, you're more frequent than Dan, but Matt Leonetti does the once a week type of posts. Maybe this is kind of coming back into fashion here. Jason, your thoughts. I would love that. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what would happen if you took an actual like two weeks off. Does the engagement on the first post back actually do better? Like, I want, can we find the guy who wrote the algorithm and just figure this out? Because if I found him, I'd have him locked up in my basement (laughs) permanently (laughs) at knife point, telling him exactly what it is to do. But it definitely does because the what Instagram is like, oh, she's back. Let's Mm -hmm. serve it to everybody. Let's get her back. Let's get her obsessed with this app again. Just like if you haven't posted on TikTok in a while. So I think it it definitely does help. I like what you wrote about consuming other agents content. I think that there's a, a, a caveat, like don't just copy other agents content. I think that consuming it just to see what's working and then putting it back into your own words is really important. But I think... Uh, maybe this is just speaking for myself. I follow a lot of agents too, right? And so like, I think I can fall into a trap really quick of just parroting a lot of other agents content, which then just kind of um, creates this like ecosystem. Cause then you, all the engagement you're getting is from other agents who have said the same thing and they like it, but is the consumer really liking what you're saying? Yeah. So you can get into a, a little trap there. 
um, consume other other fields, right? Other lawyers, doctors, you know, stuff like that, and then go on other platforms too. Like like Tessa was just saying, I really like to consume on TikTok and then try to repurpose it back because TikTok's about three weeks ahead of Instagram, so you can yeah. you can get on trends early there and figure stuff out. By the time it's hit Instagram, there's already been five or six people who have posted it, and so it's like, damn, you're missing out if you're not on other platforms. I'm. Exactly. Uh- I am incredibly excited. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I need like a, a two week detox of, of Instagram and social. Like I'm just, you, need, you just need a two week detox. detox. Yeah. I do need a two week. Right. But speaking of that, I mean, at the same time, like now everyone's got the blue check. Right. So it's kind of like now everyone's, we'll talk about this later in the episode, yeah. but now everybody's verified and you know, we'll get into it. But uh, I just, I need like a social media break because a lot of it's not real life too. Like that's the other problem is you kind of get sucked into like what people are portraying when, you know, it's not always the case, you know? And yeah, it's hard. It's easy to fall into that trap. So it's nice to have that little break and kind of get away or even just go on another app. I mean, my, my TikTok. <laughs> Take a job. break from Instagram TikTok. to TikTok. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take a break from TikTok to Twitter. Yeah. All right. Uh, any, any I, final thoughts here, uh, Eric? Yeah, I got, your, your honeymoon I, got, engagement? Yeah, I got, I got one more point on my, my honeymoon revelation. Some of this is useful stuff though. You know, yeah, we're yeah. not just. No, I think it's when, when to post, right? Like yeah. take a little bit of a break. Inspiration is all very helpful. Continue. The, yeah. It, it's impossible to come up with content when you're not doing anything. So when I was sitting on the beach of Kosumi or when I was, you know, frolicking through sea turtles or scratching my leg on coral or crushing my ties or inhaling pad thai, uh, you're not thinking of anything real estate wise. If you're not doing real estate activities, it's impossible to come up with real estate content. If you're not consuming content, you cannot just sit there and conjure up things. Chat GPT actually does help alleviate this. But I mean, Tessa, I'm sure you come across this. Like if you're not doing anything, how can you come up with content, Jason, Dan? So if you agree, let me know Say Absolutely. in the comments. Yeah. I mean, Say I mean, hi. The, the most content that I come up with is always from interactions that I've had, like in the business, whether I exaggerate them or not. But if I wasn't doing anything, if I was just, I don't know, swimming with sea turtles and drinking Mai Tais all day, I, I don't know. I don't think I'd have any real estate related content. <laughs> yeah. you. A lot of the people that don't do any business either or that are not active, it's, they're in a slump, right? Yeah, the, be- the best content comes from activity. Yes. That's all the right. point. A- any final yeah, thoughts here, Tessa, Jason, before we move on to uh, Boomers? One thing I'll add on that, that's just like, I think I go to a lot of events, both as an attendee and as a speaker and just a supporter at times. And typically when I'm like surrounding myself by other people or really immersed in like the industry or something happening, I do start to get all of these ideas. So I just keep like a big running spreadsheet and I categorize them because it is true when you're kind of like low on activity in your life, it's harder to pull something out of that. You can maybe get one post of like what I learned from the sea turtles, but outside of that, you kind of have to, (laughs) you know, pull from the archives, right? So that's been interesting. And I, I keep on that spreadsheet too. I have a VA that goes in and pulls all of my old content. So I have this like constant spreadsheet of old posts dating back to like 2017. And it's also fun to pull those and kind of like do now the abridged version or an updated thought on that and continue to kind of help those evolve into new content. And obviously it's a lot less work to having to come up with something new every single time. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, I I think we, uh, I really want to hear this review. Okay. All right. This is the review. Can we please? And then we'll move on to topic number two. I mean, this yeah, is like, a little, it's little long here. Review I've ever heard in my entire life ever. I don't know if you were watching Jason during the last segment. Were you checking your pulse there? Are you okay? <laughs> you were sit, you were standing there like this. Me? Yeah, you were like this for like <laughs> half the segment. Did I freeze? With, I never touched. Left, no, you were just like this. I don't know if you were. Wait, what's the word for see through? This, this guy, what's you know, you know, like uh, translucent. Yeah, this guy's translucent right now. Yeah, like, you look, you look like a fantastic was, four character. I was watching opening day, and Judge hit a home run in his first at bat. Oh, he uh, did. That's yeah, that's fantastic. Your Yankees are playing my Giants, and he's one yeah, for one. I know. I, know. I love the inner league play at the start. All right, yeah. this is about the House of Ginger. This was the most <laughs> memorable dining experience of my life in the worst way possible. The nightmare started before we even stepped foot in the restaurant. My wife and I, we were on our honeymoon, stopped in a bar called Bitter Truth for a cocktail before dinner. And when we told the bartender where we were going, he looked at us like we had just committed an unspeakable sin. We shrugged it off thinking this was just a you know cool local guy who looked down his nose at touristy spots, but our optimism clouded our judgment. The second we stepped into the restaurant, we could tell something was off. The staff was in complete disarray and the ladies at the table next to us looked like they just ran a marathon. Their heads were darting around like panicked squirrels, seeking someone to fill their empty water glasses. 
When the waitresses finally attended to us, it felt rushed and uncomfortable, like she wanted us to leave immediately. And I wish we had, Dan. I wish we had. <laughs> My wife foolishly ordered the salmon carpaccio. Not sure if I spelled that correctly, but if I look it up and see a photo, I might projectile vomit. <laughs> the waitress presumably had never heard of this dish, considering my wife had to repeat herself six times and point at it. I assure you this was not a language barrier. She was shocked. It was even on the menu and probably for good reason. Anyway, I tried to counteract this order with the duck larb and some spring rolls to keep it safe. Oh, I forgot to mention my drink looked and tasted like swamp water. <laughs> when the salmon came out, it flat out stunk. One of those dishes where you take one bite and look at the person you're eating with to see if they share the same level of concern. My wife made a face like she was eating maggots from Fear Factor, and then I knew I was in the clear to push this toxic dish to the side. However, we remained hopeful and positive as this place was highly recommended. It was a Michelin restaurant recommended by the Four Seasons. We didn't want to surrender to the thought that we just drove 40 minutes to punish our stomachs. Then the duck lard came, came out. It tasted like cat food infused with literal shards of wood. We both took one bite and knew that it would be our last, maybe on this earth. Once the spring rolls came out, the experience shifted from horrific to fun because we became kind of slap happy. You know how if you like, you stay up from a, a long night of no sleep, you're studying for finals and you just start giggling with your study buddy, Dan. You remember that? Did they do that in Coastal Carolina? Probably not. I studied once. Yeah, exactly. The rolls were basically glued to the plate. And the mangoes look green and possibly two weeks beyond the ripeness. Absolute trash. This was game over. I mean, this is like six paragraphs long. I can't keep getting into this. I, people will start to lose interest, but we'll put a link down below to that review. Basically, it almost put me in, like I said, the Chiang Mai hospital. Don't go there. All right. If, if you want to see the rest of the review or if you think that's the most insane review you've ever heard, uh, let us know in the comments. The ending is hilarious. I mean, the fact that you were – basically punishing yourself for 18 hours uh, made me laugh out loud. All right. Anyway, on to topic number two, this article is from Real Estate News titled Boomers are now the biggest group of buyers. And this article will be in the show notes along with uh, Eric's insane uh, <laughs> review. So the key points are rising interest rates and high home prices have uh, stalled the millennials in 2022. The share of first time home buyers dropped to a record low of 26%. Buyers are moving farther away, but they intend to stay in their new homes longer. So thanks to a challenging real estate market, baby boomers are back in the home buying driver's seat. The older generation basically overtook millennials uh, as the generation with the largest share of home buyers last year, according to a new report from NAR. Um, the 2023 home buyers and sellers trends say that the boomer generation had 39% share of home purchases in 2022, while millennials had uh, only 28%. So to summarize, first time home buyers are at a major disadvantage with affordability while boomers had equity built up to use to then buy a another home. Uh, second, more younger boomers are transitioning into retirement and looking to move closer to grandchildren or other family members or possibly even their dream home uh, in a different part of the country. So with that being said, Jason, I'll pass it to you. Are you seeing this in your market where you know maybe... Uh, less people our age are buying and you're, and you're seeing those people that had all the, these years of, of positive equity built up, you know, moving across the country. Are they buying their dream home in San Diego? What are you seeing? Yes to all of that, except for buying the dream home in San Diego. Right. So like San Diego, especially most notably is expensive. So, so like everything you're saying is just on a bigger scale here in San Diego, because the entry level here, it, you know, our average sale price is over $850,000. So the entry level is, you know, seven to $800,000, which is a lot of money if you're talking about a nationwide number. Mm -hmm. And so I, when, it, when you sent this article initially, I, it, I was reading it as like, oh, boomers overtook millennials for the top spot of share. And I'm like, that didn't really happen. What happened was millennials fell out of the top spot. And that's kind of sad. And it, it's what we've been talking about for like four years on these podcasts and these shows is the affordability issues. The, the price of homes. And now in 2022 and now three with the interest rates going up, um, it has made it harder and harder for first time home buyers, millennials, especially to, to get into the housing market. So, so, you know, you said here, 28% uh, of the market share was millennials in 2022. It was 43% in 2021. And it yeah. was 30, you know, seven or 38% in 2020. So it was trending up. And then all of a sudden, 2022, it dropped out, the bottom dropped out for millennials. So yeah. I think more than anything, it's just these are the it, this was the cautionary tale we've been telling for four years and now we're starting to see the results of it and mm -hmm. and, and it's only going to get worse now as prices continue to you know stay or rise um, because the, like you said the, the boomers have the equity to then do a move up buy or, or pull out an equity line for a down payment and the millennials don't yeah um, 
anecdotally, we have millennial home buyers, sure, but like on on an, on a whole, it's 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 getting really tough. Uh, Tessa, how can we market to like strategically market to boomers? Like, is that using Facebook? Is that using LinkedIn? Right? Like, I don't know how many boomers are are on my Instagram watching my my funny skit. So, Dan, what's a boomer? Uh, well, I only know what that is now because I had to look it up before the show, but it's somebody that was born from 1946 to 1964. Oh, man. Boom! I wish we didn't have that conversation before the show. I would have loved to see your brain scrambled. Yeah. But yeah, we, Tessa, how do we how do we market to the boomers? Yeah. So I definitely I have always been a big believer in Facebook. I do believe that that uh, platform as a whole like encompasses the majority of all different kind of segments as far as age and demographic. So I think that that one is definitely a great place to double down. I notice, and I was I was uh, off of Facebook for quite a while as far as content, and I would say in the last year or so, really doubled down on just creating daily posts on there. And sometimes they're really constructive and like important. And other times yesterday I posted a meme of this duck, like about to fall off a waterfall. I said, this is how close I am to losing my mind. Uh, and it just blows up and it just is like, kind of gives you the opportunity to connect with people on a couple of different levels. So platform wise, I always believe Facebook's a great one though. I would say as a general statement to not, I, I hear too many people get obsessed with like, Oh, I'm not going to do TikTok because this group of people is not on there. I think that that is like kind of a limiting belief in a way because you'd be shocked at the amount of people that actually do engage on all different platforms. Um, and I think that just by saying, oh, I'm not going to go on this one because of this demographic, you're really limiting yourself because it has some incredible targeting abilities. But um, on the content side of targeting that like age group and I would say this will help you across all demographics, but especially that one in particular is, you know, they want to know more of what happens throughout the entire process. So much content that we see from real estate professionals traditionally is like, you know, three tips for first time buyers or three things to do if you're preparing your home for a sale, et cetera. Those kind of things are great, but that's a very preemptive content piece, right? That's something that we're giving them as here's maybe what to do beforehand. Somebody in that demographic, our boomers that we're working with, they want to really be able to see what's going to happen once I engage with you. What's going to happen once I go under contract? I think in that article, you know, it even mentioned that they really like when their agent can help them and inform them about like financing and the documentation and all of the paperwork. So that needs to be incorporated in content of showing and like describing and kind of walking them through that process of what that really looks like. Cause they want to see complete sale transaction, like step-by-step step, rather than just those first pieces. Yeah. Tessa came to play today. And, and I like what you said Damn. too, like, you know, limiting kind of like that, the social media stuff, like my parents, I think my mom has like an iPhone five, like it has the home button still. I haven't seen one. You probably can't even find one on eBay. My mom sends me TikToks like every day. My father, who is 65 years old, doesn't know how to work anything. Facebook, Instagram sends me TikToks every day. So you really kind of, you're right. You never know who's on, on what platform. And I think a, a really good way of reaching out to some of the, the boomers too, if they're not on social media, if they're not following you, you know, direct mail always works. And what Jason, I think you and um, uh, Jimmy Mack have been doing the home uh, equity evaluations, right? Sending out that that direct mail piece with the QR codes. Everybody wants to know what their home is worth. They're always curious. So that's been a really big uh, way that we've been able to do that uh, as well. Uh, if I got one of those in my mail, I'd light it on fire immediately. Yeah. Well, hopefully you get your Everyone suitcase. In the mail though, you know, How yeah, I did get my suitcases. Thanks, Dan. Those did are great. You? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. They're clogging up the hallways. Miles can't even get beyond the couch now. So yeah, well, those were pretty Thank expensive. You. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, Miles appreciate it. Uh, Eric, as, uh, someone uh, being in the uh, millennial bracket here and potentially looking to buy, I feel like you've been looking to buy for the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a scam. After just having uh, a wedding and, and you're kind of in the situation now, like, what are your thoughts on seeing this? Like, are you guys putting off buying? Or are you going to stay where you are? What, like, nah, how, how does it make it, you feel? It doesn't make me feel any certain way at all. But I will talk about marketing to boomers. Okay. How about that? That's all good. right. I'll, I'll piggyback off of what Tessa said. Um, Social proof, extremely important. Boomers actually want to see the homes that you're sold, selling or listing. They do not care as much about the points or the funny skits or, you know, like your chat GPT one yesterday, Dan, mm. incredible video, but a boomer watching that wouldn't even understand what the hell is going on. So right. then the next day you just posted a listing that, you know, we don't know how much it's going to be, but it's got to be millions and millions of dollars. Go comment on Dan's post. He'll give you. 10 grand or something if you get it within $5,000. Psychotic way to market, but I guess it works. Genius. Uh, 
genius. Um, but they do want to see that social proof. They want accessible marketing. So a Facebook for sure. If you're posting your Instagram reels, make sure you're still uploading those to Facebook reels organically. And then, uh, yeah, do more blogs too, just because boomers do actually read content and blogs. So I would do Facebook blogs and then make sure you're doing social proof and more like edutainment style stuff. So the less like entertaining stuff, but just like, Hey, here's the houses I sold. And they want experience too. That was something in the the article, they really care about an agent with lots of experience. So showing how many homes you've sold, how long you've been in the business, that would really help. Yeah. Or you could just put top producer in your bio would probably do that. That's thing, probably yeah. the best move. Exactly. Or you could just do that, screenshot it to them and send it to them. Because they actually probably won't even understand the joke of that. Yeah. So you know what? You're right, Tessa. Because yeah. if you do put top 1% or luxury agent in your bio, boomers won't get it possibly. Correct. Yeah. They'll just take it, take it at face value. They'll take it at face value. So- yeah. Forget everything, every joke I've ever made about that. Put it in your bio immediately. Yes. Yeah, we were ahead of the curve on marketing to boomers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let, let us know what you're seeing in your market. Uh, and on to top, topic number three. Uh, but before you do, if you're interested in taking your marketing game from rookie to rock star, from Eric Simon to Tessa Bella, example, look no further than Jason Pantana's Marketing Pro. <laughs> we are true believers that marketing can make or break your brand and business. Become a marketing pro by purchasing one or all three of his modules, Cracking the Social Code, Google Business Boss, and Inbox Hero. Our listeners will also get a 10% discount by using code BAMPRO at checkout. The link will be in the description, but visit TomFerry.com backslash MVP to learn more. That's an ad read. Let's go. That course right. is great, by the way. I, I took the, uh, the Pantana Instagram course. It's fantastic. Tons of insight. Yeah, I nice. did. Good, good, good. Glad. Yeah. Uh, that's where you got all that information from. From that you've been spending. Every, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's just just coming through Pantana up my spine, <laughs> out my mouth. You're starting to look like him too. All right, <laughs> topic number three. I just, here. Need a, I just need a bomber jacket and <laughs> and talk about uh, Google My Business. And then I'm good to go. Uh, topic number three. NAR's generational trends report reveals what consumers look for in an agent. Um, and oh, Eric, I have a question for you. Do you know oh. what the, since you tried to chirp me, do you know what, um, gen Xers, <laughs> the age group of gen Xers are? No, no. Oh, they didn't. Yeah, no. You know what? I think they were born in the 1960s. Oh shit. It just went away. What, what about yeah, the mid 1960s, early 1980s? How nope, about that? Nope, nope. What about the silent generation, Eric? Did they teach you that at the U of A? No, no. They didn't teach you that. No, the SC. The yeah, seventy-seven to ninety-seven. That that's okay. That's silent the generation. silent gender yeah. is that the same as the silent majority? You know about that, Dan? <laughs> no, I have no idea. All right, we're going to be putting these graphs up on on the show. So if you're watching this live, you'll see. But there are charts here to uh, basically explain different age brackets because I generally have no idea. I mean, a Gen Z is, I guess, I don't know, nineteen to twenty-four. Younger Gen Y millennials, twenty-four to thirty. This is insane. So we're going to put it uh, up here so you can visualize it. But essentially, this is what the um, the average person and age group in their different demographics are looking for in their agent. And it's kind of consistent, right? The same few things. <clears throat> Most uh, important factors when choosing an agent for on the buy side were uh, agent experience, that the agent is honest and trustworthy, their reputation, that the agent has a caring personality and is a good listener. The agent knows the area or the neighborhood, that they are friends or family, uh, and that the agent is timely and accessible. On the flip side of things, when sellers are looking for their agent, kind of similar, uh, that the agent is honest and trust trustworthy was number one. Friend or family was number two, which is insane. Knowledgeable was number three. Uh, commission was number four. I don't know if we could talk about that or not. And that they were readily uh, accessible or easily accessible was number five. So kind of the, the same, you know, same five things, right? The fact that family, right, friends and family is number two, in my opinion, is absolutely insane. Um, but Jason, I'm going to ask you first, like what sticks out to you here from this report and like in both, both instances, reputation and experience or sales <clears throat> top the list, what happens if you're like a brand new agent or you're somebody that doesn't have, you know, 400 sales like you or, or right. Like, yeah, ultimately like you just get on a team, right? Like that's why we always encourage new agents to probably get on a team or under a good mentor so that you can piggyback off their success. Um, use your, first you use your success, then you use your team success, then you use your brokerage's office's success. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere in there you'll have uh, some, but yeah, I mean, honestly, that's why a lot of people don't make it for the first couple of years is because 
this report, it, it every year kind of says the same thing. People still get most of their uh, clients from referral base and people want to work with people that they uh, are good at what they do and they're trustworthy. You know what I mean? And so like a lion's share of like people coming in are coming in because of your past experience or they were referred to you by someone else who they already trust. So if you're a brand new agent, you don't have a lot of that stuff. It, it's tough, but that's why we do encourage early to get onto a good team or, or get onto a brokerage that does a lot of business in your area. So you can piggyback off that, off that business. Tessa, for somebody that's new, right? Or like, I guess the, the second thing here is like an agent that is uh, honest and trustworthy, right? H how do you kind of brand yourself as somebody that is an honest and trustworthy person, right? Like if you never met someone, like if somebody went on my Instagram, I don't know, they would say that I was, I mean, I would hope so, but <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I'm dressed up as an alien. I pretend like I'm chat UBT. Like, I don't know if they're going to say that I'm trustworthy, <laughs> right? You know? So yeah. like, you know, how do you establish that? Is it just like the social proof? Is it educational content? Would you say, I think there's a couple of different factors here that come into play. Obviously, video, I think, is definitely an important factor. Not only is that like a well-performing piece of content, but that's typically what I've received as feedback in most cases is people, when they meet me in person, because I've done so much video content, if they've been consuming that, you know, they instantly make that correlation of, oh, you're exactly how you are online. I know that I'm going to get the same person. There's already sort of that uh, entry point of trust and connection built. So I think that piece is really important uh, to make sure that we're using that to build that trustworthiness. But secondary to that, and I think this is so crucial when it comes to social proof, and Eric, you mentioned the importance of that earlier. Like, I think of social proof so much more than just posting the houses that you've sold or a review, but actually like a case study. Mm -hmm. So especially if you're trying to get towards a specific demographic age group, things like that, you know, finding those kind of clients that you've helped or, you know, have been helped by your team that you're on or within the brokerage that you're at and actually doing content around like a case study of the scenario they were in, the struggles that they had, how you helped them navigate that. And then the result, like it's, it's obvious that the result was probably that you helped them buy or sell a house, but there were so many other factors that you could have contributed to as a skilled agent. Uh, and that's really going to help elevate that trust and connection so much more than just, you know, I sold my 50th house, my 100th house, my 150th house, totally. actually building yeah. that storyline. Are, are these the best points ever made in walkthrough history? Tessa is like, I think she has, I think she's the third seat. Like you are absolutely crushing it. And, and to piggyback off that too, like the social proof, right? If you don't have the sales or, or if you can't really share that out, sometimes even just doing like a day in the life or, you know, doing like showings, like pictures of, of showings of houses, um, doing, you know, like open houses every single weekend. I'll give you a little secret here. What I do is sometimes if I'm driving around and I pass a nice house, I'll pull over and I'll take a picture of it and I save it, put it in my face. worthy right here. This is the guy you want. <laughs> take a picture Exudes of it. it. Integrity. What, picture. what Tessa said there was was clutch though, because instead of saying, "Yeah, I just sold my fiftieth house," you write that as how we use an escalation clause to help our clients win the house. Yeah. Now you've just shifted the whole narrative onto the client. You got to show off something that you couldn't see from the outside, mm -hmm. um, or how we found, you know, how we wrote a direct mail piece to find an off market deal so that our client could beat the. Comp you see what I'm saying? So like by changing it just from "I sold the house" into "How we did X to help our client," you're going to win way more. It's yeah. like an interview question. It, if you've ever interviewed for a job, they'll ask you like, what's something you did at your previous company, a problem, and how did you solve it? This is kind of just taking that out of the interview and then presenting it. How would you present that case study though? Would it, you like, would you be doing a video of it or would it be like a long text post or both? Yeah, or I think in any instance you can get somebody on a video, that's great. Although we all know some people are not great in front of a camera. And if it's too prompted and questioned and stuff, it, it can yeah. seem fake, just like a fake written testimonial. Um, but I think that you can tell a major story through carousel posts as well. Like, and obviously we've seen those continue to work better and better as the algorithm, algorithm has shifted a little bit again. And so incorporating some sort of carousel post where you've got those, you know, eight to 10 slides and maybe you are showing the house, maybe you're showing the family, maybe you're having some written content in there of highlighting, you know, what the struggle was, what the solution was, how you guys did that. And if you can incorporate some video clips in there, I think that that's just a, a double win. Sure. Yeah. The carousels are the move. I've even seen like uh, sports accounts, like house of highlights and ESPN do a slide to the video as opposed to just posting the video. So house of highlights, will do something like James Harden crosses up deer and Fox. And then it'll be a screenshot of that. And then you swipe and then there's the actual video. 
Right. Yeah. So clearly, they even the, the flight, which is a good indicator for the algorithm, you know, and yes. then they watch the video. Yeah. So instead of just posting the reel, they're saying, okay, I'm going to do a slide. Yeah. And you'd be surprised too. Like, we, what we do is every time we're at a closing and everyone's saying, Oh, thank you so much. We appreciate all of your help. Like we'll just kind of do like a quick little video or, or a picture. Right. And like you said, you do kind of the carousel. It's almost like a, a, a review right on the spot. So now you're doing a carousel post of like the review, their actual faces, you know, on, at, on camera reviewing it. Um, kind of some of the obstacles of, of what you went over. It's that's the social proof right there. Mm-hmm. And you guys interrupted me. But what I was saying is sometimes you might not be on a showing, but what you can do is you can take a picture of a, of a house of a random house or maybe if you are on a show and you take a picture of it, save it. And then a week later, if you're, I don't know, not doing anything, post it like as if you're working. People now will associate you with, oh, wow, Dan's doing an open house every single weekend. Wow, Dan's showing houses every single day. This guy's an absolute maniac. He's working 75 hours a week. We love Dan. That's social proof. Yeah, you could also duff six sand shots in a row and yeah. then say you got a six on yeah. a par five. Even Wait, though I saw you duff on six this, shots in a row. Jason, what? Jason, out of this, out of this, out of the three of us, me, Tessa, oh. and Eric, why don't you take a guess on who snapped their six iron over their neck at their wedding? This Tessa. <laughs> Tessa. <laughs> Tessa is Tessa's a winning. golfer too, by the way. She could probably. Yeah. Tessa's a good shooting. golfer. That's why I threw that out there. She is. Tessa, <laughs> Tessa, do you think you could be Dan in golf? Yeah. You played <laughs> high school, right? High school and college. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you probably beat both of us. And Jason. In a minute, though. Yeah, like, if it was right now today, you might have a you might have a fighting chance, but give me a week and no way. Yeah. Well, I can't even hit a club if I'm 220 in because you hear that, Dan? 220 because my six iron is in the trash can on Ridge Three at La Paloma Country Club. Ridge one. Oh my god, I wish I had the picture. I gotta put this oh, I do. All right, go ahead. Yeah, there it is. Oh my gosh. This is by by the way, never play a golf round before your wedding because you're just so in your own head. You are com- completely nerve ridden. I couldn't drink or anything. I play so much better when I'm under the influence because I'm like swinging fluidly. <laughs> and I just got a hot dog, a throat rocket, as Dan called them. Um, and I was feeling good. I was like, you know what? I had a horrific front nine. Back nine's gonna be fantastic. I snap hooked my first one, snap hooked my second one, and I was like, I'm done with this. Boom. Snapped it right over my neck. Truthfully, so. the most athletic thing I've ever seen in my entire life. All right, any uh, any final thoughts here on, on branding on on this uh, last article? Uh, I thought what was interesting is um, a a referable and recognizable brand. They acknowledge that your brand is your face, your words, and your heart, and all this becomes your story. What clients say about you when they refer you? You'll need a beautiful website that represents your brand. All social media's uh, channels should be aligned visually with your brand, including photos and contact info you'd be surprised by how many people you google or you look up and like i mean either their area is wrong they have a headshot from 30 years ago like they're you know it was like they were 19 years old like hey you're 57 years old maybe let's update that right <laughs> um so all, all these things you know are, are important in, in you know building that brand any final thoughts here except for eric's uh six iron that's in the trash can i do have uh, one thought yeah. that i think is so important like you rattled off the what five or six things at the beginning of this um, particular article that were kind of ranked in order. Uh, one mm-hmm. thing that I've always used with clients and always suggested for agents to use with clients is having some degree of like interviewing your client as well in the initial phases of working with them. Because as much as we can read articles and have data and statistics that say, hey, the most important thing to this group of people is, you know, how nice you are, how trustworthy you are it ultimately comes down to your client. And so if I'm basing it purely off of that data that I read, that's one thing. But if it doesn't matter to the client that's sitting right in front of me, I could potentially lose them because I'm too focused on trying to fit into this statistic. So I think taking that information, but then also really having those in-depth conversations, it sets you up for such a deeper relationship. Absolutely. Is Tessa the host of the show? Is that? (laughs) Right now, Tessa has 56 points. I have... 48 probably dan six points jason 27 <laughs> points I like you oh, gave yourself is, 48 yeah, all right this is the pti version yeah, this is pti but i'm the point controller um all right if you want tessa on the show next week let us know in the comments yeah, throw us a like throw tessa bella like here crushed it you came to play today all right la- last topic is kind of just we're just gonna riff a little bit here but meta verified finally came out and was released in the u.s seems as if everybody uh, is verified now. We have March Madness ending, opening day for baseball right now, hockey playoffs next week. Let's go. Basketball playoffs, succession just came back. 
Um, Ted Lasso just came back. Great show. I cry every episode. Uh, Hasbula just came to America for the first time ever. You should go watch that vlog. It's incredible. It'll make you laugh no matter what. WrestleMania. Eric would know nothing about that. Uh, we have a lot coming up. And the Masters, Augusta. So great, where great we, month coming up Where do we here. go from here? Um, yeah, you, just, you just dumped it all. right? <laughs> Tessa, give us your thoughts on March Madness, Hezbollah, Meta Verified, and opening day in baseball. Okay. I really want to know your guys' thoughts on Meta Verified. Yeah, let's do Meta Verified. Yeah, let's hit Meta Verified because I will be honest, I had no idea it was opening day of baseball. I don't follow that whatsoever. But um, yeah. basketball is a little different. We got Kevin Durant here, so that's maybe a different story. But um, all right, Meta Verified, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I think that obviously on a business side from Meta, it's a very smart play. I think that they're going to continue to increase that monthly subscription fee and they're going to start limiting people who are not paying for that. Um, I think there's yep. really pros and cons to it. Ultimately, I ended up doing it. Um, and I've heard some people seeing some direct impact on the exposure that their posts are getting as a result of that. I sort of- Positive that, or negative? Yours was negative. No, no, no. She, he said positive or negative. Like, oh, like positive, you're saying you're yeah. positive, okay. positive. Yeah, yeah, like it was starting to actually get a little bit more because of that, um, mm. which makes sense. I mean, like with anything, if you're on TikTok and you pay for- uh, sponsored ads or something like that one time, then all of a sudden you've basically shown that you're willing to pay to play. And so they're going to start suppressing a bit more of that organic in many cases. So I think it'll be interesting to see how it continues to play out. Um, I think that trying to position it like it's something to do for our safety or protection or, you know, really validating anyone's accounts is kind of BS. That's been BS since day one, because anyone could have paid for it, got fake press, done all that stuff, which many people did as well. So it's, I mean, I paid, it didn't work, but, uh, you know, it, it was never about the safety and protection of people and users on Instagram. It's really just a, a money game in my opinion. But yeah, doesn't it said, help? Like ahead, the fact Jason. that it's verified now, it does, it does give us a little bit of like knowledge that you're dealing with at least the right person. Right. Like, Cause like, it's so I like, I mean, think that because there's so many people now that have it, like it kind of lost. It's like, it's, it's a lure, like sure, from, from the allure of like the check mark being like society, like builder, it lost a little bit cause everybody gets it. But like the fact that at least, you know, cause now with all the duplicate accounts and hacked accounts and crypto scams and stuff like that, it's good to know you at least have the right person. I feel like, so there is a yeah. little bit of a, and see it, what Twitter did was they, they, they did this about three or four months ago. And then they came up with like different color checks for like government agency, mm -hmm. celebrity, news person. And I wouldn't be surprised if Instagram then does that again too, yeah. where it's like, okay, baseline is you have to be verified just to, to play. But yeah. then a red check means you're a celebrity and a bit. So then it's going to, we're going to go right back to buying red checks instead. But for at least the baseline now, we know we have a safe account, which is going to be a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I mean, I, I paid 30, whatever it was. I had all the press written up. I had 30, 30, what? 30, uh, pebbles, uh, you know, 30, 30, 30 shekels, rubles, 30 rubles. Um, but I paid for some press and I had the blue check and, and this is going to sound like incredibly, um, douchey and I'm not trying to come off that way, but at the time, what it did for me was huge because I was able to comment on everyone's stuff and it would always go to the top. So then I would get likes and follows I would literally go to a restaurant and I would say like, Hey, you have a table at, you know, I'll say catch. They'd be like, no kick rocks. And then I would like, you know, DM them on Instagram. They'd be like, Oh yeah, we have a table for four, you know, right now. It's like, really? I just called. He said nothing. So at the time it like really meant something, but now I kind of feel like, because, and I'm, again, I'm, I don't have it anymore. Right. Obviously I lost it. I'm being honest, but I feel like now it kind of lost that. I don't know. Like that feel. Hey, you so see maybe. what he was doing. He was building that trustworthiness that, that people are looking for in an agent. Yeah. Exactly. I should have been verified anyway, okay? That's <laughs> I've, I have noticed, at least in my my scrolling, that so many more verified accounts are popping up, and I'm seeing way more suggested posts. And they keep turning that volume on and off so much, where a couple months ago it was no suggested post because of the Kylie Jenner tweet and because everybody was complaining that you're not seeing your friends' posts anymore. And now it's 20%, 30% suggested posts from verified accounts. So it's definitely probably helping with that engagement. And our brains are so conditioned to see that blue check that even on Twitter still, even though it's like 80% blue checks now, I'm still more likely to read the content of someone with the blue check. Yep. Just like I am more likely to watch the video of someone with the blue check or respond to someone with the blue check. So that's, I, I don't know if it's good or bad yet. I agree with Tessa. It's, it's got positives and negatives, but I don't know what's going to happen with the broke agent account or the now BAM account, because this is right now the only thing you could upload, I believe 
Tesla, cool. correct me if I'm wrong, our driver's license and passport. Like, can you upload your EIN number or tax records or any? Yeah, not that I like mean. That? I think that it is uh, like only really catering to personal accounts, not so much the business yeah. ones. <laughs> is that funny, Dan? <laughs> yes, it is so funny. It is. It is because like I have. You know, there there was something about the blue check, and this also sounds douchey, but it it legitimized your business. Mm -hmm. It legitimized like who you were, not yeah. necessarily like from a personal standpoint, but just like I, I had had a long term goal of getting the broke agent verified, and I knew at the point that that would happen, it would mean there was enough press. This is like a legit brand, a legit company, and that it would really help explode my growth and establish a new level of brand trust with people. And now every agent that has been following with the broke agent is verified and the broke right. agent probably is not going to get verified. It's, I, there are it's agents ironic. That have 700 followers that like literally made their account. You know, what's so insane. I made an account for my puppy who's less than two months old. I don't post on it. Nothing it has 55 followers. I could get the badge for his account. I can't get it on. Does he have a driver's license? Yeah, I wonder I how know. they do that with dogs. Because Refer Network is available to get verified, but I'm not. But how do I assume if I clicked it, then it would say upload ID, and then I'd have nothing to put. So then Refer couldn't do it. But but I, as an individual, still haven't gotten it yet. So like it's yeah. weird. Like I have it for Facebook, but not Instagram. I don't know. I know. Oh. Yeah, it just rolls it out differently to different accounts. They do this with all their features. It's really upsetting. The, because... the last two people on earth that will receive this. Well, actually, I mean you. You mean yeah. you? Yes. Yeah. We will. Hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Um, all right. Any any other thoughts? Ted Lasso has Bula. March Madness. <laughs> Succession's back. Greatest show on TV right now. Succession's really back. Awesome writing. Yeah. Succession is day. best written show of all time. I mean, yeah. the people that watched Last of Us, any Last of Us fans here? I watched it. But... I, I watched it. Okay. I didn't love it. No, no, yeah, no, it was no. not that good. Everybody was like, oh, this show's unbelievable. How can you compare that to Game of Thrones or Succession and just the no. writing and the dialogue? Like, they're on completely different levels. Yeah, good show. Um, good zombie show. I think Walking Dead was probably better written. It was just fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but... Tessa, what do you watch? Yeah, Justin, I don't Tessa. watch literally any of these shows, so I have nothing to contribute to that. She's like, I'm a producer, and you guys are lame. Tessa's <laughs> <laughs> been to 15 different states in the last two weeks, and we're sitting here talking about The Last of Us, exception <laughs> Hasbula. I've watched the Hasbula Comes to America video 10 times. It's on right now. Hasbula just like punched his cat in the face or something. He's actually in hot water. Oh, no. Give him some time, man. All right. He's from Dagestan. Give him some time. <laughs> you know, uh, listen, right. I'm not a you know, he was uh, good. about the size comparison of him to his cat. He was it was maybe self defense. That's actually Valor true. Point. It would Valor. be like you having a tiger run up on you. You'd have to hit it. A yeah, tiger. What do you mean? It'd be like a giraffe. Point, yeah. Points, 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 oh. points. Tessa gets all the points. Thirty points. Yeah. Tessa, yeah. you 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 win. You you can have. My How about seat. this? Well, one thing before we before we sign off here, let's just get predictions here since we are in the the final stretch of a couple sports mm -hmm. NBA championship. West Conference, Western Conference is kind of up for grabs right now. Sacramento Kings. Cassidy Kings. Do you actually believe they're going to win the Western Conference? No, they're not going to win the Western no. Conference. I think the Suns have the best team in the West with Kevin Durant back, but I think that we will make it to the Western Conference. So who wins the championship? Uh, I think the East. I think the Bucks, the, the team to beat. The okay. Bucks and Tessa, the East. Are the best Tessa, teams. Suns. I am, I, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go with Suns just out of pure blind loyalty. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Suns fan. Fun fact: Charles Barkley actually fell on me in sixth grade. I was sitting courtside behind the you don't believe me jason i was sitting courtside no, I behind you. I'm the basket you, you and your story of peter piper pizza and barkley oh. <laughs> with a pass from kevin johnson member kj yeah he uh remember he's sexy from, rexy sec, rex chapman exactly barkley fell on my leg in my first ever basketball game so i'm going to predict that the golden state warriors unfortunately are going to win the championship <laughs> because i despise them I don't and like that because I think we're playing them in the first round. So that means a first round. Upset. People want to play Sacramento in the first round. Oh, get off that take. No. Anyway, Dan, what about you? Uh, I say the Bucks too. Bucks or the Knicks? This <laughs> smooth. Hockey player. I'm a hockey more than basketball. No. Um, Great pick, by the way. A couple of days ago, Dan texted me. He goes, hey, man, you, you, you thank me later. And I was like, why? What's going on? He said, take, take the devil's money line against the Islanders. <laughs> Devils lost five to one against the Islanders, but a minus 160. Absolutely ridiculous. Great, great. Uh, all right. Well, this is never going to make the show. So thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, we really appreciate Thanks, it. Thank guys. you, Jason. <laughs> nice, nice shirt. Tessa, you absolutely crushed. Thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you for coming on. Eric, welcome back. I'm glad. 
Like Can you hear this? What the hell is that? Okay. Yeah, shut that off immediately. All right. Did you hear that? Make sure. Yeah, we heard it. Make wow. sure you like Was this video if you enjoyed it. Make sure you follow the House of Agents podcast. That's Tess's new podcast. Uh, we will link that down below. Follow Jason Cassidy. Follow Refer Network. Follow Dan O'Neill. Subscribe to this channel. Like this photo. Follow us on Instagram. Venmo us. <laughs> Find us on AAIM. You on yeah. you know I'd be balling 44 at AOL. Oh, by the way, also this. If you're listening right now, if you've made it this far, we have two right. little secrets for you also in the description. You ready? No we have no no. Listen, people are still listening. We have a green screen ebook, how to do the best green screen possible. And then we also have another ebook, Dan, which I can't remember <laughs> what it was. Haley, do you remember what the, the last ebook was? Chat GTP. No, no, oh. video production. All the yeah. stuff you need. You need gear. You need a camera. You need a mic. You need a light. Link down in the description. Free downloadables. Boom. Let's go. Bye, Diane. Bye, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>